I think we'll ever just have a quiet year at Hogwarts. No. <laughs> Did you know that in Chapter 16 of the first book, both of Harry's friends get a final time to show their unique skills? However, Hermione's final time to shine, the potion riddle, was cut from the movie adaptation. Originally, Harry and Hermione leave the wizard chess match after Ron's sacrifice and come across seven potions on a table. Three of the potions are poison, two are wine, one will allow Hermione to go back to Ron, and the other will allow Harry to go forward. When this was cut, they changed her special moment to be the devil's snare trap where she can identify this strange plant strangling them and know what to do about it. In the book, the devil's snare trap is a group effort where the disposition of each friend gets them closer to the solution. Devil snare, devil snare, what did the professor say? It likes the dark and the damp. So light a fire, Harry choked. Yes, of course, but there's no wood, Hermione cried, wringing her hands. Have you gone mad, Ron bellowed. Are you a witch or not? It's in character for Hermione to forget to use magic to solve this problem when she's panicked. But it's better for the structure of the movie's story if she gets to have her moment. Ron will get his moment later when he beats the magical wizard chessboard despite the fact that he not only had to protect his king but his friends as well. So maybe Ron didn't need to remind Hermione that she was a witch in that scene. But you know what he really didn't need to do? He really didn't need to do this. Woo! Lucky we didn't panic! Lucky Hermione pays attention in herbology. There are a lot of people out there on the wild internets who believe that the movies made Ron a lame comic relief character, or they made him too mean, so they stopped liking him. Some go as far as to say that the movies ruined Ron Weasley, and they dislike or hate one of the most important characters in a series they otherwise love. My thesis statement for this video is this. In my opinion, what's mangling Ron in the Devil Snare scene, and most of the time throughout the series, is the impulse to make Ron look oafish, silly, or mean for a joke when it really wasn't necessary. Somewhere along the line, Harry went from having two friends who were smart in different ways to having a smart friend and a lesser sidekick who is having his skills, observations, and lines absorbed by his best friends. The main consensus of people I've talked to about this summarized the problem as they made Ron a goof to make Hermione a cool, proactive role model for little girls to look up to. That explains scenes like this where Hermione's taking a line from Ron. If you want to kill Harry, you'll have to kill us too. But how do you explain stuff like this? Glad we're out of there. And dialogue changes as infamous as this. You think I don't know how this feels? Oh, you don't know how it feels! Your parents are dead! You have no family! I think it flies under the radar how often Ron's characterization has to bend to give Harry cool moments, impactful moments, or just softening up the text a little bit to make our protagonists less flawed. So now begins our exploration of the two Rons, the Ron Weasley from the Harry Potter movie series and the Ron Weasley of the book series written by J.K. Rowling. Harry, I don't like this at all. Shush. In Book 2, Chapter 7, Draco calls Hermione a mudblood. It's a word both she and Harry have never heard before, but they know it's nasty because immediately chaos erupts around them. Ron tries to attack Draco, but his spell backfires because his wand was broken in Chapter 5. Later, while vomiting up slugs, Ron explains the general concept of pure blood supremacy and why he thinks it's wrong. He concludes by pointing out that Neville Longbottom is a pure blood wizard, and he's kinda garbage at magic. Currently. In the movie, Ron spends the scene vomiting slugs. Steve Cloves gets a lot of criticism for bias. I do think some people go too far when they start psychoanalyzing him and concocting weird conspiracy theories. But what is clear to me is that seven of the eight Harry Potter movies were written by a dude whose favorite character is Hermione. And Hermione, because she's so well-read, is also his favorite vessel for giving exposition. Should Ron get this moment using his unique background to serve as a cultural ambassador? Hmm, I don't know. The scene's kind of about Hermione, right? Isn't it more sad if she explains it? Ron's busy with his slug vomiting. Let's just use him as comic relief. It's not a big deal. Hermione probably read about it in a book. Here's a DVD extra from Chamber of Secrets. Steve, Hermione is a character who you've said in the past is one of your favorites. Does that make her easier to write? Yeah, I mean, I like writing all three, but I, I, I've always loved writing Hermione because I just, one, she's... Uh, She's a, she's a tremendous character for a lot of reasons for a writer, which also she can carry exposition in a, in a, in a wonderful way because she, you just assume she read it in a book. My research tells me that long ago in the time between the first book's release in the year of 1997 and the first movie's release in the year of 2001, Some. 
Ron was actually a more popular character than Hermione. In fact, when Rowling met Cloves for the first time, she was really nervous about what this American was going to do to her baby. But she felt more at ease when he told her that his favorite character was Hermione, which was something Rowling very rarely heard from anyone. Cloves' love for this little strong-willed bookworm got entwined with Emma Watson's growing passion for her role in the internal life of the character she was playing. Now, I understand that Alfonso had you each write an essay. What was, what was that all about? Um, well, actually, I didn't. I never did the essay. <laughs> <laughs> Choose a character. You didn't yeah. hand it your own. Yeah. No, I, I didn't do it, but... Uh, yeah, he basically asked us to write an essay about uh, who we thought our characters were, why they did the things they do, um, their background, their feelings, their thoughts, how they've changed uh, in the first year of Hogwarts, second year of Hogwarts, and now into the third year. I, I felt really so pleased with myself, because yeah. you hadn't handed yours in, and I felt so pleased, I've done it, I've done it, I've done it. So I had mine, the next day Emma comes in with all 16 pages of hers. <laughs> and Cloves never stopped loving Hermione, she's still his favourite. What I'm trying to say here is that there doesn't have to be a grand conspiracy for this to happen. People working on the movie don't have to hate Ron to lose the threat of who he is. They only have to consistently enough value other things over his characterization and development. And well, someone has to be your least favorite, right? It's natural that that which interests you the most draws your attention unless you're being very careful. In any one scene changed, there is almost always a logical explanation for why they changed it. It's just one of those things where you don't notice how far you've drifted until you take a step back. I thought you said, you know who my favorite character is? And I thought, oh, you're just gonna say Ron. Yeah. And I love Ron, but Ron's oh, no, so I love, I love easy to love. He's so easy you to know, love. Everyone loves, who couldn't love Ron? And I thought, okay, you love Ron. And then I okay, said, and then you said? Uh, uh, Hermione. I'm going to bed before either of you come up with another clever idea to get us killed, or worse, expelled. She needs to sort out her priorities. When I examine how Ron and Hermione changed through the adaptation, I think about their friendship and eventual romance and marriage. Honestly, I think Harry Potter doesn't have super strong writing behind its romantic subplots. But the movies could see ahead of time how people were reacting to the books, so they had a chance to steer into the skid and try to make it better. Let's see how they did. Has Ron gone to bed? Um, not yet. No. Shoelace. Merry Christmas, Harry. Oops, it's worse. The only way to really explain it is that the movies have this strong aversion to Ron and Hermione as a couple, as well as Harry and Ginny, especially Harry and Ginny. The situation with Ginny and the beige dishragification of her character is so bad, it deserves its own video. But trying to stay on topic, it tells me something that Ron and Hermione moments that would take no extra time are still downplayed and underutilized. <laughs> When Ron hears the screams of Hermione being tortured, he should be yelling like he did in the book. Repressed reactions can be cool, you know, shaking, sweating, but this ain't it, Chief. This is way too repressed. Maybe he doesn't even care because it sounds like they only got a few seconds of Emma screaming and just played it on a loop. We have to do something. There's no way out of here. <laughs> Oh, you can't fool me, that's a bloody tape recorder. Throughout the series, Ron and Hermione bicker a lot. But when I reread the books and remember all the random little things they start bickering about, these exchanges don't come off to me as a failure in them being able to get along. It comes off more like they're bored and that this is fun to them. Hermione can be intolerant of certain personality types. She also loves to debate. She's argumentative. Ron is one of the few people that Hermione can go full debate club on that will argue back and not get upset or take it personally. Harry thinks they argue too much, but considering that they can become offended by Harry interrupting them or telling them to stop, hints that Harry is not experiencing their bickering the way they are. What I liked about this dynamic was I never really had to question if Ron respected Hermione. He is consistently on her side. He knows she's a know-it-all, he's aware of her flaws, but he still likes her and he sees the strengths those flaws bring. Ron will defend Hermione when people go too far. 
Five points from Gryffindor for being an insufferable know-it-all. Hermione went very red, put her hand down, and stared at the floor with her eyes full of tears. It was a mark of how much the class loathed Snape that they were all glaring at him because every one of them had called Hermione a know-it-all at least once. And Ron, who told Hermione she was a know-it-all at least twice a week, said loudly, You asked us a question and she knows the answer. Why ask if you don't want to be told? Movie Ron has fewer opportunities to engage in this behavior as is the nature of an adaptation of a book. But Ron does not always use his time well. Like, uh, what is this? That is the second time you've spoken out of turn, Miss Granger. Are you incapable of restraining yourself, or do you take pride in being an insufferable know-it-all? He's got a point, you know. Granger, don't you have somewhere else to be? <laughs> yeah. I hate it. I don't like it. I'm not a fan of it. I'll go easy on Thanks, Ron. Book Ron is aware past book one that Hermione is hyper-competent in magic. Oh, I've been emasculated by losing to a girl at something being a dude gave me no advantage in. I let her do that. It's good man, isn't it? It's completely intentional. Did you see me disarm Hermione, Harry? Only once, said Hermione, stung. I got you loads more than you got me. I did not only get you once, I got you at least three times. Well, if you're counting the one where you tripped over your own feet and knocked the wand out of my hand. This is actually the movie Steve Klobes didn't work on. Although, I guess you could argue his characterization was already set in stone at this point. Book Hermione is pretty canonically the one who is the most skilled with magic on a technical sense. She has by the book perfect form, and she's the best at wandless magic. She's not really the best at fighting because she has a hard time functioning under the pressure of real danger. But yeah, anyway, Book Ron is not threatened by her in this chapter. Ron is happy about being able to win a few rounds against Hermione because he knows she's talented. And Hermione is being a sore loser about the few times she lost. Ron and Hermione get into a couple of notable fights throughout the series, like their fight in Prisoner of Azkaban. I'm warning you, Hermione. Keep that bloody beast of yours away from Scabbers, or I'll turn it into a tea cozy. It's a cat, Ronald. What do you expect? It's in his nature. A cat? Is that what they told you? Looks more like a pig with hair, if you ask me. That's rich, coming from the owner of that smelly old shoe brush. The scabbers crookshanks fight is a pretty solid example of Hermione not being able to people real well. Hermione is in denial that Crookshanks probably ate scabbers. Ron is actually wrong because Scabbers is Peter Pettigrew, but... All he wanted was for her to take seriously that Crookshanks wanted to eat Scabbers and keep Crookshanks under control. And after his rat disappears, he just wants an apology. He wants Hermione to admit that she was wrong. They argued. Hermione stormed off in tears to the girls' dorm. Harry thinks it's going to be the end of their friendship. Hermione went to Hagrid's hut to cry. This was a big deal. In the movie, Hermione's a little indignant, and Ron whines at her a few times about it. Harry, you've seen the way that bloodthirsty beast of hers was always lurking about. And Scabbers is gone. Well, maybe you should learn to take better care of your pets. Your cat killed him. Did not. Did. Didn't. So the conflict doesn't feel important. It's kind of like a background argument. You're seeing less of Hermione's flaws. She's looking a little smooth. She's an airbrushed Hermione. The Yule Ball fight, on the other hand, highlights all aspects of Ron's awkward social immaturity, as it should. The night begins with Hermione having her Cinderella moment and ends in a fight with Ron. Yeah, that's what I think. You know the solution then, don't you? Go on. Next time there's a ball, pluck up the courage and ask me before somebody else does. And not as a last resort. Well, that's, that's, I mean, that's just completely off the point. It's not an exact recreation, it doesn't happen in the Gryffindor common room, but it's basically the same fight given the same weight exposing the same flaws. Actually, if anything, I'd argue it's harsher. And that feels out of place to me now, because this was supposed to be a back and forth exchange. Last movie was Hermione's turn to be wrong, and this is Ron's turn. This is how they grow. But I can't help but recognize the external factors to why this happened. Walking into the set of the Yule Ball, was absolutely amazing. Everyone had to pretend they were in awe when they came in, but I think it was really genuine, actually. It's the best set I've seen so far, I think. The description in the novel is that it's a kind of ice palace, really. There are icicles hanging from the magic ceiling. So we've taken that maybe a step further. When I went in, I was absolutely gobsmacked. I cannot tell you how 
beautiful everything looked. You recognise it as exactly the same space, but the transformation is nonetheless pretty complete. The whole thing, of course, looked like Swarovski crystal and was stunning. Two people fighting about a rat and a cat is a very simple, personality-driven conflict. It's not really as exciting as a winter ball at Hogwarts where, ooh, everyone has to find a date, oh, romance, oh, coming-of-age stuff. Turning the Great Hall into a frozen wonderland was a massive undertaking. Look at this set! Look at all this stuff! Look at all these costumes and all these people who have to learn to dance! They wrote this scene to have some weight. They were really proud of this. They put a lot of work into this scene that is barely 10 minutes of the movie. But then you have to take a step back. This more perfect version of Hermione is not helping this dynamic. It starts looking less and less like they're growing up and trying to become their best selves together, and more and more like this smooth Hermione is either trying to fix Ron or is waiting for him to become a smooth Ron. And that's kind of sad, right? Both for the characters and the fans, but also for Cloves. He said one of the reasons that he was so drawn to Hermione was because he saw her as the outcast of the outcast. It's Leviosa, not Leviosa. He thought she was complicated and hard to love, and that makes it seem like he couldn't capture what he liked about her. Hermione is not an effortless genius, she's a genius through effort. She studies hard no matter how boring the professor is. The amount of time she sinks into this comes at the cost of other things. Movie Hermione has not completely lost her flaws, I think that's an exaggeration, but she's not nearly as flawed as she was in the books. I can confidently say that book Hermione needs her friends just as much as they need her. Harry headed straight back to Gryffindor Common Room, where he found Ron and Hermione playing chess. Chess was the only thing Hermione ever lost at, something Harry and Ron thought was very good for her. And it was true, because Hermione was the melted. character that, and it stayed throughout, <sighs> um, because I think she had such this huge intelligence, but it was really a kind of exasperating, frustrating character in a way, though, that it was like the girl that bothered you in school, yeah, <laughs> but you totally. couldn't stop She's thinking about her. So, um, not always the easiest to like. Very no, but, I, but I, I liked that about her. That's um, what I liked about her. I'm Ron, by the way. Ron Weasley. I'm Harry. Harry Potter. As I said before, it's not surprising to me that when discussing what happened to Ron, everyone focuses on Hermione and Harry gets to fly under the radar. If you go, okay, Hermione stole Ron's line here. If you want to kill Harry, you'll have to kill us too. That's kind of easy to understand, right? How Harry warps Ron is more structural. In fiction, people often think it's a good idea to give your audience a blank slate character to attach themselves to so that they can learn about the world this character inhabits. This character can ask questions that we would want to ask. We're like alien parasites doing recon through an empty false vessel. Book Harry does contain details that make him not a total blank slate to me. Despite stereotypes about people with glasses, on the nerd to jock false dichotomy, Harry is more of a jock interested in sports, sport teams, and physical activities. His grades are fine, but he's not a very intellectually curious person. He tends to only go out of his way to learn new spells if he needs it for class or to survive some trial. Like when he learned Accio for the first task in Book 4. Although he tries to be outwardly polite, he can be judgmental and it takes a lot for him to change his mind about someone. Harry struggles for a long time to see the adults in his life as complicated, flawed people until their three-dimensionalness slaps him in the face like a sweaty, soggy slab of salami. In fact, his stubbornness is one of the main reasons many of the plot twists work. Harry's personality is not as quirky as other characters who inhabit his world, but, you know, it's hard to look unique when you have dragon-loving half-giants and sock-loving house elves running around. You may have noticed a lot of the stuff I just listed has more to do with Harry's thoughts and opinions, a thing the movie does not narrate to us. These two characters make all the same decisions, and yet they come off as really different. It's kind of cool how important that internal narration is to the story's protagonist. The way I would summarize the change between book Harry and movie Harry is the temperature has been lowered. This isn't spicy Harry, he's at most a little zesty. He is overall a smooth Harry. The removal of Harry's internal dialogue makes him seem less judgmental and angry. When how much he resents or is disgusted by other people is left to your imagination, his temptation to do bad things becomes a little more more surprising. As a result, he's a character who's calmer, meeker, and has more of a sweetness about him. Here's a weird fact. In the book, very often, Hermione was kind of the unfavorite friend. Harry can be really rude about her in his internal narration, calling her shrill, bossy, or hysterical. I'd argue Harry grew a deeper appreciation for Hermione the older he got. He loves her to death, they have their own unique bond, but in terms of just hanging out, she's not the funnest person to be around, so he kind of favors Ron. 
You miss him, Hermione said impatiently, and I know he misses you. Miss him, said Harry. I don't miss him. But this was a downright lie. Harry liked Hermione very much, but she just wasn't the same as Ron. There was much less laughter and a lot more hanging out in the library when Hermione was your best friend. And it comes up when Hermione fights with Ron. She feels strongly that Harry favors Ron and that she's the more expendable friend. She's not unaware that people see her as a buzzkill. Okay, side with Ron. I knew you would, she said shrilly. First the fireball, now scabbers. Everything's my fault, isn't it? Movie Harry feels more like Hermione's best friend, and I think it's because he's quiet and we're not privy to all his negative thoughts about her. Because of this, I think the bond between Movie Harry and Movie Hermione gains a lot more chemistry and is drained of some of its more awkward elements because you can just kind of pretend that Harry always gets her and is always sympathetic to her. Harry can still be immature and Ron is his best friend who's more on his level mentally. That friendship is really important to Harry. It's not an accident that Ron was put on the bottom of the lake during the second task. Harry was really actively sad when Ron stopped talking to him in that book. No any spells? One. But it's not powerful enough for all of them. Where's Hermione when you need her? Here's another thing to chew on. The movie has to invent what Ron is doing in scenes where Harry is not describing what he's doing. The Aragog scene from Chamber of Secrets uses Ron as comic relief, having him make funny faces and whine at the sight of all the spooky spiders. Movie Ron does a lot of whining, but book Ron agreed to go in when Harry asked him. Come on. What? You heard what Hagrid said. Follow the spiders. <laughs> Head into the dark forest. Why spiders? Why couldn't it be follow the butterflies? Harry, I don't like this. Harry, I don't like this at all. Shush. Something wet touched Harry's hand and he jumped backward, crushing Ron's foot, but it was only Fang's nose. What'd you reckon, Harry said to Ron, whose eyes he could just make out reflecting the light from his wand. We've come this far, said Ron. But we don't actually know what Ron was doing the whole time because Harry isn't keeping track of him and describing his reactions. Then they made the scene of the boys getting away from Aragog more complex. Get Fang, Harry yelled. Diving into the front seat, Ron seized the boar hound around the middle and threw him, yelping, into the back of the car. The doors slammed shut. Ron didn't touch the accelerator, but the car didn't need him. The engine roared and they were off, hitting more spiders. In the movie, this scene is turned into a full car chase. The car is not driving itself, so Ron stops the car before they get out of the Forbidden Forest and says, Glad we're out of there. Only to get chomped on by a chill practical effect that just wants a hug. And then Harry has to save him. Then Ron keeps freezing and failing to drive the car, or the car fails him and Harry has to help and protagonist it up. This version has more tension and is thrilling and spooky, but it makes Ron look a little foolish. And as a result of this, Harry, our main character, looks braver and more heroic in comparison. Can we panic now? Before getting into the biggest example of a Ron change that flares up anger in people, please allow me to obsess over an obscure example that I've never seen anyone get mad about, but it kind of bothered me, and it's sort of funny. In the third book, there's this hilarious moment where Ron calls Harry. Harry's Uncle Vernon picks up the phone and Ron is screaming at the top of his lungs into the phone asking to talk to Harry. Ron has never used a telephone before and he doesn't know how they work. It's an endearing, in-character example of Ron's ignorance of the muggle world. Would you like to see a dumb version of that? Mom used to read me those. The Wizard in the Hopping Pot, Babbity Rabbity and the Cackling Stump. Come on. Babbity Rabbity. No? Okay, assuming Ron's family had a different copy of the book with no runes on the cover, because if they did, wow, Ron, you study ancient runes at your school for wizard craft and witchery, the book is called Tales of Beetle the Bard. Beetle the Bard was a wizard author. I have a copy of the Tales of Beetle the Bard. This book and all five of the stories in it couldn't be sold to a muggle population in this universe because every story exposes the existence of the magical world. The Wizard in the Hopping Pot is a story about a cruel son compelled to help muggles by his late father's enchanted cooking pot. In Babbity Rabbity and the Cackling Stump, a clever witch tricks a king and his brigade of witch hunters to stop hunting witches when she fakes her death and makes them think that she has cursed them from beyond the grave. Ron knows his best friends were raised by muggles. He knows Harry's aunt and uncle abused him and wouldn't be reading him bedtime stories anyway. Why does he think they would know this book? Why has his IQ hit the floor like a sack of bricks? Well, it's because it's a funny joke. 
and even if it's not a joke that would make sense for his character, it might slip by most people. And if they notice, they can just write it off as a lapse in judgment, because after all, Ron's not the smartest guy, is he? Where's my wand? I don't know. Harry Potter, you give me my I don't wand! Have it. Let's move on to the scene. Your parents are dead! You have no family! We'll start with Ron getting squinched when they make their escape and end up in the wilderness. Accio Disney! Alright. Unstop for it! Money is <laughs> I know, just do it! I actually love this. I think it's sad. I feel the urgency. It makes me uncomfortable. I think all three of them did a great job. But Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1 is a PG-13 movie, so there isn't a lot of blood. The injury isn't the nicest thing to look at, but it's not the same thing as finding Ron unconscious soaked in his own blood. The text describes that a chunk of his arm is just missing, as if cut off by a knife. Harry has learned about squinching, but he can only think of it as something comical. The reality is extremely grisly. The Dittany is all Hermione dares to do to heal Ron. She's afraid that if she starts casting spells, she might kill him. The effect of Dittany and what it does is not explained to the movie's audience. Dittany accelerates the time on the wound. It makes it several days older, and that's all. When I read Deathly Hallows, I feel stressed about the fact that Ron never really recovered from his injuries. Here, he seems sore and demoralized, but I think that if you'd only seen the movies, you wouldn't understand what, if any, limitations there were to how much Harry and Hermione could heal Ron. The urgency of Ron's healing is heavily tied to the food issue. Ron can't be healed by magic, and he's not getting enough proper nutrition to heal naturally. The trio is stealing eggs and bread from farmers. They're foraging for mushrooms. Harry caught the world's most pathetic fish, apparently. Any food they get their hands on, they have Hermione duplicate to make more, but that lowers the quality of the food in terms of taste and nutrition for the sake of having more of it to fill their stomachs. They live like this for a couple of months. So Ron is festering, right? Mentally and physically. And maybe he could handle it until it's his turn to wear the Horcrux and that's when things get bad. A detail left out of the movie's argument is that they learn Ginny, Neville, and Luna have been sent into the Forbidden Forest with Hagrid. This is meant as a punishment, but Harry is relieved. He can't think of the Forbidden Forest as dangerous because he's lucked out so many times. This is some of the stuff that Harry is saying while Ron is silently listening in. And Snape must have thought that was a punishment, said Harry. But Ginny, Neville, and Luna probably had a good laugh with Hagrid. The Forbidden Forest. They've faced plenty worse than the Forbidden Forest. Big deal. So the original fight starts off almost word for word the same. But then Harry has an I'm sorry thrown in. I'm sorry, but I don't quite understand. Then the word mummy is switched to mum, dulling the humiliating sting of this comment. You thought you'd be back with your mum by Christmas? I just thought, after all this time, we would have actually achieved something. Ron's line, we thought you knew what you were doing, as in he and Hermione, turns into I thought you knew what you were doing. I thought you knew what you were doing. I thought Dumbledore would have told you something worthwhile. After Ron's awful comment, Harry tries to tackle him. And then he tells him to leave, which seems like a natural conclusion to this conversation because it's already escalated to violence. Book Harry tells Ron to go home three times during this argument. And then there's the line that I keep mocking. You think I don't know how this feels? No, you don't know how it feels! Your parents are dead! You have no family! <laughs> It's all right for you two, isn't it, with your parents safely out of the way? My parents are dead, Harry bellowed. And mine could be going the same way, yelled Ron. Insensitive, but not mocking him for being an orphan. Also, the line, you have no family, makes it seem like Ron doesn't think of Harry as his family. And I honestly don't think that's true. I think both Harry and Ron feel that Harry is an unofficial member of his family. And that betrayal of his expectations for Harry is part of what's fueling his anger right now. I think Book Ron is offended because he's starting to feel alone in his paranoia and worry for the well-being of his family. He thinks he's seeing a division in the priorities between himself and Harry. It looks like movie Ron has already come to the conclusion that Harry is not his family without the whole element of him being insensitive to Ginny being in danger. And that just kind of bums me out. Then there is the romantic jealousy. I can understand reading this why Ron feels like Harry has, without any plans, brought Hermione, who he loves, into a very dangerous situation. But because the movie has all of these scenes of Ron getting jealous of them being in proximity to each other or just getting along despite the high stress levels of the situation, that makes me think that if Hermione was just giving this Ron kisses, that would fix everything. That's probably why years later people meme on this part of the movie. They're watching this thinking that he looks like a guy who's having no fun on this camping trip. 
There's something really ironic to me about Ron, a character who's supposed to be overcoming these feelings of inadequacy because he's overshadowed in life by his exceptional brothers and by his exceptional friends, being overshadowed by the movie's writing. Anyway, I'd like to announce my Patreon. Which brings me to my second announcement, a special thanks to Jake Colburn, my first patron who found my Patreon before I announced it. I made my Patreon when the website announced that if you wanted to get in on the whole founder's fee rate, you had to make an account that day. So I was like, oh, I might need that someday, I guess I should make one. So then my first patron showed up, and it was sort of like being attacked by a ninja, but instead of hitting you, the ninja wanted to be supportive. Have you guys ever gotten attacked by money ninjas? If you join my Patreon as a reward, you'll get behind the scenes stuff, you'll find out what I'm working on before anyone else. I upload videos of me playing video games unscripted, just like, you know, chill bonus content. Basically, I tried to think of the kind of stuff I would want from video essays I like. I have a Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram linked below. And that's it. Do you canoe?